They find it incomprehensible, uh, and sometimes they even find the European Commission unwelcome in the, the host city. The treaty-based structure also brings us a curious blend for the European Union. Some general powers, some institutional powers, and some specific and often very, very precise policy instruments. And as an example, the excessive deficit procedure is laid down in the treaty. It is expanded upon in further legislation, but the basic procedure itself is actually laid down in the treaty. Um, it also brings, particularly in the economic area, a mix of competences between the centre and between the member states themselves. So here is where we run into one of the fundamental <coughs> problems of the economic crisis, the different levels of EU economic policy integration and how they fit together. Now, for the Eurozone, monetary policy is clearly and squarely fully integrated through the ECB. Budgetary policy is constrained, as I've said, through the, the treaty directly and through the Stability and, and Growth Pact. But budgetary policy, of course, goes right to the heart of national sovereignty as well. And on a third level, economic policy is subject to coordination. We have a number of rules on that. But there has been a need to increase the degree of coordination through the crisis as a reaction to what we've witnessed as an insufficient level to keep things on an even keel. So with the crisis, the EU has had to develop new mechanisms and new structures, ever more arcane, ever more complex, even by our own very high standards on these, these things. And member states have had to examine for themselves 
the limits of their independence in setting their economic policies um, as we realize that we're in a world of ever more interconnections and ever more rapid transmission of financial stresses. Um, with the cases which financial stress uh, can be transmitted, that's pressed policymakers to react with a speed and a decisiveness that requires constant attention to maintaining democratic legitimacy to act. If you have to take a serious decision very, very quickly, <coughs> you have to be clear that you have the authority to take that decision. Um, you also have to be clear that you're going to deliver the right results. That's the second leg, and the most important leg for the EU's legitimacy is achieving the right results. Um, this aspect, particularly for an audience like the UK audience, uh, has to be the prime driver of what the EU is about. The EU will not keep the people with it unless it delivers real benefits. Um, it's natural in times of crisis, when people are experiencing real hardship, to question the legitimacy of those who have taken the decisions that you feel lead to that hardship. It's also natural to point to someone or something that you can identify as a them rather than an us, as the cause of those problems. And it's also a natural reflex to defend the actions that you've taken, or even to claim that the hardest and the least popular decisions were not within your control. Now, my personal belief is that the EU, and in particular the member states making up the euro area, have taken <coughs> some extremely difficult, but also some extremely positive decisions in very, very challenging circumstances. Um, I have seen a level of collective responsibility that has stabilized the single currency, <coughs> such that a year from now, let's hope we aren't doing any more Eurozone crisis talks, um, and has paved the way for each member state within the Eurozone uh, to find a path back to economic recovery. Now, I stress member states within the Eurozone, because even within uh, the coordinated structures of the EU, it's member states who are key decision makers on the majority of economic policies. The member states must determine their own budgets within certain constraints. It is the member states themselves, uh, outside of the formal EU structures, who have established the European Stability Mechanism and put the financing needed behind that. And it is the member states who must deliver on the structural reform agenda that will underpin a return to growth and prosperity. We coordinate, we advise, but the member states in the end have to deliver on those economic policies. Uh, member states, I believe, will also need to agree on further coordination and deeper integration, particularly within the euro area, going beyond what we've already achieved and what has come through in the last couple of years. Um, I think it is possible to establish the right mechanisms within the EU framework with the right level of democratic accountability, um, both at EU and at national level, to deliver the results that people demand. Um, it's going to take a lot of serious reflection. It's going to take an open debate about who takes responsibility for what levels of action and to whom those responsible will be held accountable. Who does what and who do they answer to for it? Um, decisions in the EU are currently certainly perceived as being distant from the citizens that they affect, and the effects of decisions taken in the EU are certainly looming ever larger in people's daily lives. Um, I'm not 100% sure that the understanding, the broader understanding, or the engagement in EU decisions is based on firm foundations. We have to be clear and we have to be honest about who is responsible for taking key decisions. We need to be open and transparent in making ourselves <coughs> accountable for those decisions, and we need to be committed to a genuine debate on the issues that really are at stake. <coughs> committed to building that debate at a European level, and not just at an us and them level. Um, I very much welcome the chance I've had to share these thoughts with you today. Uh, I salute the interest and the dedication that you're all showing just by being here on this glorious one-off summer's day here in London. Um, I very much look forward to some lively debate from our large and distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, and I'm very pleased indeed that the European Commission's representation in the UK can support events like this. I hope to be supporting many more, and I hope to be able to talk to many of you both today and afterwards. With that, I'll hand you over to the main event. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs>
Thank you, thank you, Carl. Um, uh, in the interest of brevity, I think I will stay here, and I guess the panel will stay here. My name is John Pete. I'm the Europe editor of The Economist, um, and we don't have very long to debate this, and we have five very distinguished speakers, so I will say very little by way of introduction. Um, I really just have four sentences I want to add to what Kyle said. Um, the first is that this is quite an old problem. I, I'm embarrassed to say I've been one way or another dealing with European, then European community matters now for over 30 years. And I think I first heard the words demographic, democratic deficit in 1982, three years after the direct elections to the European Parliament first came in. So we are dealing with an old problem. But I think as Kyle also said, it's become much more acute because of the Euro crisis. Um, the Euro crisis has led to a general agreement that to solve it requires greater integration among Eurozone members. Um, and the money being provided for Eurozone bailouts is clearly national money, not European money. So it raises big issues about the roles of uh, those responsible for national money as opposed to European money. Um, I, I recall a comment in a note written by Ulrike Gero and um, Thomas Clough a year ago, she's going to be on the next panel, um, when they quoted a German finance ministry as saying, it's quite easy to solve the euro crisis, we know what to do. The real problem is legitimacy, um, the legitimacy of what is being done. Um, and I think that is uh, a very true point and one of the reasons why this is such an interesting subject to debate. Um, the third point that makes it very relevant is it's quite clear that the popularity of the EU and its institutions has declined very sharply during the Euro crisis over the past few years for some of the reasons that Kyle mentioned on input and output legitimacy. Uh, recent polls, um, Eurobarometer and Pew, for example, showing 72% of Spaniards don't trust the EU, 75% of Italians think European integration has been bad for their country, 78% of the Greeks and 77% of the French responding that European integration has been bad for their country. So it's not just a British problem either, it's a general problem of, um, of unpopularity and loss of faith in the institutions, in, in the project. And I think it's particularly true of the institutions as well, the European Commission being one of them, but also the European Parliament. Um, they have lost um, uh, much of their uh, popularity if they ever had any. Um, and the last point I want to make which gets to the issue of federalism, at least as I interpret it, although federalism is a word that means many different things. In Germany, it tends to mean decentralization, whereas in Britain, it tends to be regarded as centralization. But I do think in this democratic legitimacy <coughs> debate, the relative roles of the national parliaments and the European parliament is very central to how we proceed from here. Um, and that, too, is a, an, a, a, a long-standing problem. But my perception is that national leaders and national debaters have David Cameron being one of them, but not the only one, Angela Merkel being another with the Bundestag. They have tended over the past year or two to talk up the need for greater involvement of national parliaments by implication at the expense in some areas of the European Parliament. So there is an institutional tension there with a desire to, to impart greater legitimacy to this project through a greater role for national parliaments. Um, and I hope our speakers will also come to address some of that. Um, that's all I wanted to say. I'm going to take us in the order of Andrew Walton is going to speak first, then um, uh, Calypso Nicolaides from Oxford, then Francis Cheneval from Zurich, then Andrew Duff, Member of the European Parliament, with a finish off by Dario Castiglioni from Exeter. And I hope our speakers will speak for a little more than five to seven minutes each. So, Andrew, why don't you start? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on, on this subject. So, I, I, I have quite a picture I want to draw, which covers five points. And in five minutes, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be hard work. So, I'm going to be rather parsimonious, and I, I'm happy to expand uh, under questioning. I want to start by saying, I want to answer this question about the Eurozone crisis, the democratic deficit and federalism by thinking about foundation of what is the European Union there for in its first instance? What is its justification in some sense? And I would want to answer that question by saying, the primary function of the European Union, uh, of a supranational organization of this kind, is to improve the lives of individuals within it. I take it that we have a set of rights and obligations to one another, both within states and across states, 
And I take it that in a world, especially a globalized world, one thing that uh, is difficult for uh, a nation state to achieve by itself is the realization of these things alone. The virtue of a supranational organization is it increases our capacity to address these rights, both within our own borders and across borders. So I take it that the idea, the justification of signing up to such a supranational organization is to better align the nation state's commitments um, uh, to, to, to its own legitimacy, internal and external. I take the next question then to be, why would we care about democracy within such an institution? I want to answer that by saying this. I'm going to take democracy very broadly to mean something like the equal suffrage of subjects under some authority interested in forming and pursuing a common good of the kind I've, I've given. Um, thus, we are equal uh, subjects to the law's republic. Why would we want democracy? Um, I take it that there will be two rationales there. One would be instrumental. Um, uh, democracy, as is well known, is good for producing good policy outcomes. And the second is something about moral equality of the actors. Democracy, uh, given its, its substantive commitment to equal political rights, recognizes the moral equality of actors underneath authority. In that sense, the aim of democracy, uh, connecting to the, the, the idea of the EU, is to pursue something like a democratic society in the top field sense, equal substantive rights and treatment by an authority. So then I reached the question of <clears throat> thinking, what can we learn about the idea of federalism that speaks to this picture I've given as a foundation? And what I want to say is, I think there are two ways in which the idea of federalism can speak to improving democratic legitimacy and the aims uh, of the EU, and, and we can see that with some reflections on the Euro crisis. The first thing I want to say is, federalism, I take it, um, will say something important about the type of citizen <coughs> control of any um, authority. In particular, I want to draw attention to the idea of a balance between regional representatives and cross-regional representatives. Um, I take it at the moment, the European Union um, focuses mostly, as we've already uh, had mentioned, is, is increasingly going in the direction of national representatives. But indeed, there are cases where we have uh, significantly uh, people uh, making decisions that are one step removed even from the democratically elected national representatives. We have certain bodies within the European Union that are making uh, decisions uh, even, what, even further from, from, from individual citizens. And what I want to say here is I think that, in some senses, has problems for both of the concerns I mentioned. Some decisions that have come out of these bodies recently have, to my mind, been not great decisions. I think some of the austerity packages that were given um, more recently have had conditions attached to them and have had a general structure that I think um, uh, was, not, was not ever going to have a positive impact, uh, to be quite frank. But generally, that, um, uh, that we have a set of decisions that are suboptimal in some sense. I think that's also true from what we're seeing in the stability and growth pattern that fiscal union, that some of these, the structure of these agreements is in some sense ill-designed to address some of the key issues that prompted their, their discussion. In addition, there's a tendency in this structure to have a sort of executive federalism um, um, uh, notion going on, and that seems to me to violate the, in, at least be in tension with the moral equality that I take it is important to any democratic structure. Federalism, in this sense, I think, recommends, or looks like it recommends having this more, uh, having more cross-regional um, citizen input. Uh, so we have seen some uh, more attention, especially in the Lisbon Treaty, to improving and, and bolstering the role of the European Parliament. But I take it in some sense we could also go further. We could uh, bolster its uh, substantive role, its monitoring role, and indeed we could also think more, more far-flung ideas such as <coughs> having a pan-electoral uh, system in the European Union. And I think that, from my side of it, I think that their federalism has something beneficial to say about um, uh, it's going to give us something positive democratically speaking. Um, the pan-European dimension, I think, has uh, a, a, um, a, a more substantive focus on the common good that I stress as being important in my understanding of democracy. And I think also building that, that relationship, uh, I think it, it, one of the key things, the incentives going on in the, the justification of any democracy is the ability to throw the rascals out, in a sense. And whilst we still work with nationally elected representatives of, for whom European politics is one sub-dimension, we're, we're less likely to have that incentive mechanism at work in national representatives. Where some kind of pan-European representatives, it's, we can more specifically respond to them doing a bad job of European politics. In that sense, I think that <coughs> this would improve the moral equality um, of the structure and uh, help realise the, 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 the uh, have some instrumental benefits. The second thread I want to focus, just say something about, is a question of lock-in. So one way in which I think 
the EU is not a federal structure. I mean, in one way, I take it that it might be a confederal structure or a, or a federal union in some sense, notifiably with Article 50 of the Lisbon <coughs> Treaty and the unilateral right to exit. This has been one of the big things, and of course, ties in with the sovereignty question. Now, to my mind, that right of exit is quite problematic from a democratic perspective. Um, my, mo my most notable example uh, in the context of the Euro crisis, of course, has been the UK's position and how it has reacted to certain responses to the Euro crisis, Cameron blocking uh, early, early ideas about treaty changes, <coughs> and of course, at some point later on, uh, making lists of uh, 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 demands or positions on, on what could be possible in, in realising uh, alternative um, packs for addressing the, the crisis. But I also take it that, that there are some general things in which that has, has been apparent. I mean, some, in certain sense, the tie, the, the link to um, uh, national parliaments and, and, and opt-in, opt-out clauses and possibility of withdrawing, these kind of structures, I think, have played some role in attaching conditions to austerity packages that I, I already notified, I think, were problematic. And I also think it's a problem because of the, the, the veto and, the, and this, this ability to negotiate in this fashion. Uh, raises problems of getting agreements, common positions on, on many things, foreign policy, security, corporate tax, and so on and so forth. I take it, I think, that one thing that federalism would say is that we would want to um, downplay the unilateral right of exit. I'm not sure I, federalism has to say we remove it, but I might think that federalism might prefer the pre-Lisbon situation, where there was a kind of position to withdraw, but on the whole it wasn't exercised very strongly. It might also say something about just less opt-out clauses in agreements. Um, possibly we could think that the European Union should operate in a way like the WTO does, with a single undertaking clause, package of a, 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 um, a package of measures, and as part of the Union you take the package of measures as they are. And my instinct there is, again, there is a democratic improvement in those regards. Firstly, I think that mirrors the moral equality of democracy to a much more substantive extent. But I also think it provides the right incentive to play the democratic game properly. Um, I take my lead here from uh, an argument against the unilateral right to secede from a democratic state. One of the problems with having such a right is it downplays the incentives to actually work within the game, work properly with others in building a common, common goal. And there again, I think we could take the parallel. We, we might think that having a, this, this, uh, a less uh, substantive unilateral right of exit would be beneficial in this regard at the European Union as well. So two things I just want to say in, in, in closing that thought. I mean, one worry about what I've said here is always going to encounter a question about whether we can build the more substantive notion of democracy that I suggested in particular as a no, as a, a no demos problem that's going to be talked about by others, I think. But my suggestion is that actually the two, the two alterations that we can think about from a federalist basis give some reason to encourage better participation and indeed might themselves spur something of um, a, a demos, at least in some relevant sense. Another worry is a question about sovereignty, something we've already uh, introduced. But my sense is this, we have a number of qualifications built within the European Union structures um, that are going to mean that these kinds of changes do not see that much sovereignty. Right? We still have a subsidiarity clause, we still have a qualified um, majority voting system that are going to retain a certain level of sovereignty within nation states. And to the extent that some sovereignty is lost by these changes, I take that it's in line with what I initially said about the function of supranational state, that that's acceptable actually. If it improves the legitimacy of states in their internal and external relations, it's not a massive loss to lose some element of sovereignty in that. So what I want to conclude by saying is just this. Nothing in which I've said, I hope, has tried to imply anything along the lines of federalism equals the solution to democratic legitimacy or to Eurozone crisis or any <coughs> other number of substantive problems we have. But I think we have two lessons um, from federalism, things that go on in federalist law, that would be democratic improvements, which suggest they could be democratic improvements if we followed those lines in the European Union. And that would have substantive benefits on um, what, we, what we have a Euro European Union for in the first place, and indeed maybe some positive contribution to problems such as the Europe crisis. Thank you. Um, fine. Um, Calypso. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, we wouldn't be here if uh, democratic legitimacy in the EU was only about what is being delivered, you know, because that would be simple. Before the Euro crisis, not great, but okay. Euro crisis, disaster, we have no democratic legitimacy, and a year from now, as Kyle is hoping, everything will be rosy and we have democratic legitimacy. But of course, what we all care about here in the, academically and when we think about these issues is the way in which 
the ability to deliver in turn is affected by the democratic makeup of the union. It's not, you can't just separate uh, the deliverance with how it's done democratically or not, right? So we're trying to wrap our head around all this. And then we're asking in this panel, is federalism the solution or the problem? Now, and presumably, is democratic federalism the solution or the problem? And John has already uh, you know, spoken to the, the ambiguity of this term. But the first, the first point we need to make is that if there is a problem, it stems from the fact that we have democratic states that are, that are together in this union of ours. So why did we have monetary in the first place? Well, because Germans wanted lower exchange rates and the South wanted lower interest rate. And the democratic tragedy of this story is that all the peoples got what they wanted. That's why monetary union doesn't work, you know? That's the problem. So let's not forget that there was a democratic demand that was at the source of all this, that was aggregated because indeed we are a kind of union, whether we call it federal or not, complicated issue. And so now that we are in this mess, because everyone wanted to, what, what is the problem is of course that behind this aggregation of national democratic preferences that were bargained over in the council, there was, I am, there was in part a messianic hope that somehow this would, through a mess, more or less of a mess, but lead to some functional drive for more integration. You know, others might tell you no, you know, it was just done for purely, you know, rational economic reason. But my reading is that indeed there were met forces in European elites that were, that had kind of foreseen what everyone was saying, including Fritz Sharp in this room who already in 86 wrote about this but many others, I was at Harvard at the time, everybody was saying, this is gonna be a mess, guys, wake up and smell the coffee. But it was okay that it would be a mess because the EU has been driven for better and worse, and not only for worse, but you know, by elites who are messianic, for who the ends justify the mean, for your further integration might justify trampling upon the fragile democratic makeup of our, our, of our individual democracy. And that was kind of foreseen, and the day the mess arrives, we kind of say, well, okay, fine, the union needs more power to deal with this democratic mess. Oops, there's a problem, the is not democratic, so therefore it needs more power, that will be justified by more democratic power, and then the circle is complete, and you can see how the reasoning is circular. So people like me and others in this room might be worried about the democratic fallacy in this story, the fact that the crisis is gonna become a, a pretext for what I call crossing the Rubicon. Crossing what Rubicon? Crossing the Rubicon from the EU being a non-state to becoming a state form. Or in our federal language, from being a federal union, which is kind of okay in my, in my book, to becoming a federal state. And that's the problem because I don't think the EU can be itself a democracy as, in, as if it had one people with, under one state with one territory, one story, one government. And that's not a good idea for European democracy. And so, and in that perspective, Andrew, I disagree with Andrew that you know exit uh, the, one of the redeeming redeeming point of the today's crisis is that we are speaking again and seriously about exit. Not I'm the last one as a Franco-Greek German living in Britain, although I can't vote here, to want Britain to get out of the EU. But I think the fact that the right and possibility of exit is asserted and reasserted or in Greece indeed of exit in the Eurozone, is part of the democratic makeup of the EU as a voluntary union of democratic peoples. What I call, and what Francis calls, you know, a democracy, a union of peoples. And if the EU is a union of peoples then, this, what is the solution? The first solution is that indeed we worry hugely about the democratic health of our individual member state, and that we worry not only that the EU helps the dem this health of ours, supports it, but first of all that it worries about the do no harm principle, and that these days there is somehow no pro problem with the EU harming national democracy. And that's the first, the first problem we need to worry about. Uh, and we could say much more about the relationship between the EU and the health of our national democracy. But that is the first concern we should have in today's crisis. The second is that whatever we do more of at the supranational level, fine, you know, do get the European Parliament to be a bit more uh, uh, open and all the rest of it, but 
that we do not pin all our hopes in the European <coughs> Parliament, that indeed the other institutions of the EU, the Commission, especially the Council, need themselves to be more democratic. We can unpack what that means, including through much better control by national parliament, John's national parliaments, not just of their national democracy, but of direct control of what the council does in an aggregate way. So not just an indirect legitimation, but a direct legitimation by national parliament. In, in short, that above all, at the supranational level, we don't enter mimetic logic that the European Union needs to become more like a national democracy more like a body that decides by majorities at the, at the European level. No, 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 no. But we can do quite a few good things at the supranational level in the EU so that it deals with the crisis in a more so-called democratic manner. And finally, we should, as a third family of recipe, we should worry about transnationalism <coughs> in the EU. That's what democracy is all about. Not any old peoples in their separate little democratic bubbles. But dem democracies that are open to each other, concerned about each other, takes into a, uh, account each other's interests, concerns, <coughs> worries, angst, historical hang-ups, and all the rest of it. You know, we should ask that in Britain. Because the continent doesn't, well, is not always very good at doing this, but same thing for poor Greece. You know, the continent doesn't understand some of the little Greece's worry. So transnationalism in the EU as a de basic democratic principle has institutional uh, implications, how parliaments and not, not, uh, governments and peoples need to be open to each other. And at the end of the day, it has political culture implications. Um, and that is really what you guys are all about. And we can talk more about that too. Well, thank you, Calypso. Um, <coughs> now, Francis Chenevel from Zurich. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to make this a little bit more controversial. I would like to disconnect the democratic deficit from the euro crisis. Um, has the democratic deficit caused the financial crisis and the euro crisis? No. The financial crisis started as a housing bubble uh, combined with uh, bad financial products uh, put together by transnational banking sectors in the United States. So uh, in no way can I see a structural cause in the EU for, for the financial uh, crisis. Uh, the debt crisis, the housing bubble in Spain is not a, a structural problem of the EU. It's just bad policy on, on a local level. Um, and the bad banking in Ireland, the same thing. It's not a structural problem of the EU. So if the EU has a democratic deficit or not, we can talk about that, but it has not caused the, the euro crisis. Is the response uh, to the crisis uh, a democratic issue? Uh, of course. Is the federal democratic state uh, the solution to the crisis? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. That depends. Uh, the United States is a federal state. It is continuing to drive up ever higher deficits. Um, it is in a political stalemate in regarding the question how it wants to deal with the deficit problem. So the federal structure, the federal state structure, uh, is not the solution here. Uh, Japan uh, has uh, much more of a, of a debt problem than any or many of the Eurozone member states. Uh, it is trying to get out of that problem by deficit spending now, uh, which raises problems of competitiveness. Uh, the stock market is breaking down. So again, is the centralization of political community the, the solution uh, combined with democracy, the solution to to the euro crisis, <coughs> not necessarily. It's an economic problem uh, that is linked to uh, economic logics, and you can take the, the wrong economic decisions democratically, and you can take the right economic decisions authoritatively. That's just, I think, uh, the way it is. So uh, there, I don't see uh, um, really a, a connection. Now. Uh, where we, and the second thing I'd like to say a little bit controversially is the crisis itself also has productive potential. I think one of the problems we have in, in, in our societies that are highly bureaucratic is this path dependency uh, where options are always narrowed down. And the, the nice thing about a crisis is all of a sudden path dependencies are broken, are broken again and new options come up. And, and so I think this crisis should also be looked upon as, as something that may has the potential to, to break through past dependencies and actually create new options for uh, political structuring of uh, Europe. And the third thing I'd like to say is about we should not conflate popularity and democratic legitimacy. Yeah? 
a democratically legitimate government can be highly unpopular and should be uh, in a crisis. It should be unpopular sometimes because it might ta have to take measures that are unpopular. A highly popular government can be highly uh, illegitimate. Uh, many many uh, charismatic uh, tyrants were, high, were very popular, but uh, very illegitimate. So what's, what's then uh, democratic legitimacy? And this brings me to the last point. If this crisis should teach us something, it is that uh, the, if we take the wrong decisions, we should take them for ourselves. And so whatever are bad consequences of bad decisions, uh, people should feel that they are responsible uh, for them. So it's a, it's a self-appropriation. And so whether, you know, who should join the Eurozone, whether we should have a Eurozone or no Eurozone, uh, there's an incredible disagreement among experts, and I as a philosopher will certainly not say whether we need a Eurozone or not, or what's economically better. But what I can say is whatever decision is taken should be perceived by the subjects as a decision for which they have taken democratic responsibility. Uh, thank you very much, especially for being brief. Um, right, Andrew Duff from the <coughs> European Parliament. Well, um, uh, 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 thank you very much for... Uh, oh, for, 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 oh, for asking me to speak here. It's always um, a privilege to be asked to speak in L L London. It's, it's a privilege which is surprisingly r rare for a m m member of the European Parliament from this country. Um, and I would agree to start with, that the crisis and the crisis management measures which we've been obliged to carry out over the last four years, five years now, um, I think they have accentuated the political problem of the EU, the de democratic issue, uh, because some of the measures have been uh, technocratic and have required uh, a greater forcefulness and substance of measures of surveillance, of scrutiny, of supervision from Brussels and indeed Frankfurt. And we know that the re regulatory framework is only partly in place, and there's still an awful lot more that has to be done for us to be uh, to reassure the citizen, uh, elector, and taxpayer, and the financial markets that this crisis can't happen, at least in the same w w way, for a second time. We have promises, of course, from the uh, European uh, Council of ro roadmaps and blueprints and other things like that. Uh, but uh, banking union, fiscal union, political union, but to be perfectly clear from their subsequent performance, a degree of complacency has crept in, and the caliber of leaders that, that one would expect a crisis to throw up is even to put it politely, uh, disappointing. Uh, um, we have now to seriously change ge gear from fiscal d uh, discipline to fiscal solidarity so that the b uh, burden is sh sh shared between uh, t uh, taxpayers across uh, national b borders. If we uh, fail to do this, the price of b borrowing is not going to uh, fall. 
Um, there are several approaches to doing this. In a sense, we've already started in a surreptitious way. The b uh, bailouts for Greece and for the Irish and for the Portuguese and for the uh, Cypriots are precisely the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the that sharing of the b uh, but, but they have not yet appeared to uh, be that, uh, partly because despite the uh, t tortured agreements reached, we haven't actually spent any m money as yet, uh, any y y y y European m money, on the, the exercise that we have to do to close b uh, bad b uh, banks, to s separate the sovereign from the uh, 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 banking de uh, debt. I hope that, and expect, that in this election uh, campaign to the U U U European Parliament uh, next year, there will be a greater sense of seriousness, indeed even of crisis, of the uh, need to elevate the uh, European uh, dimension of the political uh, <coughs> debate, to explain to the electors that there are serious uh, choices that are made, th that I make every d uh, day, not every day, uh, most of my d uh, days are spent uh, uh, making serious uh, <coughs> choices about the uh, pace and a direction of European integration. And we need to sort of disseminate the vitality of politics inside the European Parliament to the greater public. So there is a political chance uh, next year. And of course, it's not simply the election of the parliament, but subsequently the election of the new commission on which parliament will have a great say uh, that we uh, are going to have to do. But the second point is that it's not just about politics it's and uh, about economics, it's also about the rule of law. And at present, we know that the Treaty of Lisbon is being stretched almost to breaking point. In our secondary lawmaking, in the six-pack and two-pack, we have imposed things which are, strictly speaking, outside the uh, template that the Treaty of Lisbon crafted. In the a fiscal compact uh, treaty, we have gone uh, also in uh, directions which are not foreseen uh, by uh, Lisbon. And we have agreed to incorporate the, the, the essence of that fiscal compact treaty inside the U Union framework quite soon. We also have the Karlsruhe Court, which, as we speak, is uh, ruminating on the, uh, the OMT and the uh, role of the Bundesbank in the uh, European uh, nexus. <coughs> and we know, because we speak to them frequently, that the concern of the judges is uh, not that integration is uh, going too fast, but that it is uh, not sufficiently grounded in de uh, democratic le legitimation. So we have that as a pressure, especially on B uh, Berlin, but it's uh, f felt across the uh, constitutional uh, courts of the EU. And then, of course, we have our uh, dear uh, 
uh, uh, Cameron, who's thrown down the uh, uh, gauntlet with his alternative prospectus for uh, disintegration, but he has thrown the, uh, the uh, challenge down, and we've got to uh, pick it up. Um, and so in 2015, in the spring, there will be a, a convention uh, which will start the glorious uh, t task of uh, redrafting uh, the uh, treaties, whose central uh, purpose, it will have other things that it has to do t t too, but his central uh, purpose will be to install fiscal y y union and a federal go a government. In a draft of fundamental uh, law that I and the Spinelli group of me um, members of the European uh, Parliament will be uh, publishing in September, uh, we uh, do all of this, so the uh, convent should have a smoother task. The central feature of this uh, fundamental uh, law is to turn the uh, commission into a, a government. It doesn't w want that. Mr. B uh, Barroso is uh, terrified of such a prospect, but he's not going to be there to be able to <laughs> stop it happening. And we've got some uh, time before the spring of uh, 2015 to prepare to, to polish our thoughts and to prepare the broader public for such a dramatic and historic, I would say, uh, a deepening of integration in a federal uh, direction. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm hearing quite a lot that I agree with, but also quite a lot I disagree with, and I hope that will be true of many members of the audience as well. Um, uh, we will finish with um, Dario Castiglione. Okay, thank you, you much for uh, inviting me to uh, the discussion, and I'm very glad that I uh, only got five minutes, so I can't <laughs> make too much of a fool of myself on a topic as wide as this. Uh, but I won't promise I will stay in these five minutes. I'll try as much as I can. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not as good as virtuous as the previous speakers. But <coughs> let me start by, by saying that uh, I take the title Euro, uh, the Eurozone Crisis and the Revenue Deficit uh, perhaps in a bit wider sense. In the second part of the Democratic <coughs> Deficit, which is normally associated with the European Union, I would think here uh, in a general sense. The, the, the problem is with our democracy within the Eurozone. And I don't mean simply in the European sense. You know, it's not pro a, pro a problem of European democracy. It is a problem of how we run our democracies. And I'll explain why. Clearly, the Eurozone crisis has uh, put into motion a number of questions which have already been, uh, in some way, discussed uh, before me, uh, which are related to the way in which we imagine that the European Union is working, and also whether it's working from a democratic perspective. And one of the answers, and this was, I think, the title of our session, has been, uh, in some way, the federalist answer. My brief question, that there are different kinds of conception of federalism, and that we could discuss, you know, uh, we could have you know, one session just on that, but what I take it to be the federalist kind of uh, answer to the euro crisis, uh, which in some way perhaps has also been uh, highlighted at the end with uh, uh, Mr. Duff's uh, um, intervention, is that what we want is an, a, a greater degree of centralization and unification in our decisions for a number of important problems at the European level. And therefore, to overcome what has normally been referred other as the intergovernmental kind of method of uh, decision making, or even the kind of more consensualist communitarian method. So a federal method means this, even if we can conceive federation in many different ways. Now, my simple answer to this kind of strategy is that it is neither feasible nor desirable in the present conditions. And uh, 
And in particular, I think that this project is pursued at the moment in three different ways. There is uh, what we can call <coughs> critical federalism, or also so called executive federalism, what practically has happened on the decision about the euro crisis. There has been uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, centralization of decision making powers, both within uh, the European Union or some of the members of the European Union, also at the international level, which have made decisions uh, which have affected other people. This has been a, cl a clear centralization. This is a, you know, a more uh, dominant kind of uh, federalism, if you will. The second kind of federalism, which has been you know, pursued, I think that uh, in the previous intervention was quite clear, which has been pursued with high ideals, is towards instead a more constitutional kind of federalism, something that uh, it may be based, roughly speaking, on an idea of a demos. There has been a long discussion about this in the European Union. Anyway, an attempt to construct institutionally a real le European level of decision making with certain kind of legislative power. The third one, which you can find, for instance, in a number of articles by Balibar and others more recently, is what I would call the citizens kind of federalism. And that is the fact that either two versions of federalism, one clearly more dominant, the other one less, in some way and not, do not address the problem of the real social problem of <coughs> Europe. So there is a kind of social platform on which a real re, uh, energy, uh, a recreation of the European Union could be based on a different kind of social justice uh, kind of objective and guided directly by the people, so not top down but bottom up. I don't think that either of these three projects, however, is feasible at the moment, or, or in a sense, the first one is feasible, but I think is the most dangerous. Uh, but neither of the three is uh, advisable, I think, or desirable. And in uh, my other three minutes, I think, right. <laughs> I, I will try to explain what is, uh, what are the problems with this and what are the possible alternatives, at least in terms of thinking about uh, alternatives. Some, some of the things have been said already. The first thing is that uh, clearly we work with, uh, and that's why I think there is a problem about the crisis of democracy in general in Europe and not simply the European democracy. We work with a decision-making structure in which the national democracy, member states democracy in Europe, are already locked in certain kind of decision-making processes. This, this kind of interlocking has been justified on the basis of intergovernmentalism, for instance, in terms of the legitimacy that may come from the national government, from the member states, but this argument is no longer viable because the effect of the kind of policies, the economic policies, particularly which have been uh, in, uh, decided in the last uh, few months or few years, has uh, shown that the kind of issues on which a certain level of Europe decided affect definitely what, how the democracy works affect the life chances, the decisive life chances of all the European citizens. The question is, therefore, if we cannot go, as I don't think we can, towards this federal level, should we simply retreat at the national level? That is the real question with the party we, we are facing. You know, and uh, after all, the Euroscepticism that has been uh, cited uh, uh, earlier on uh, in, throughout Europe you know, shows this kind of thing, the kind of... Uh, Populist or non populist kind of parties, or that uh, in some way ride this kind of way, show this. There is a popular sentiment which uh, <coughs> clearly goes against Europe, not simply because of uh, you know, national sentiments, but also because the effect of the social policies. One of the main uh, uh, failures of the constitutional debate not, was not to have a constitutional debate but was not to treat the real constitutional issues, which are not simply institutional, but also what is for the people who live without a community. The two fundamental issues which were important at the beginning of the century, or this millennium, I should say, were the enlargement, which meant the start of mobility of workers across Europe, which creates real problems for everyone, of course, and the other one was monetary union. None of these two issues was discussed as a constitutional one. You can't simply give uh, institutional bread to people. You need to give policies also within a certain frame. 
And that's also what constitutional debates are about. Now, to finish with, I think that the, the real problem is that uh, we need to work <coughs> with uh, in the condition in which we are. The condition in which we are can be taken in two senses. One is what kind of democracy we can construct in uh, conditions in which uh, <coughs> democracy still require a fundamental kind of uh, political debate, political opinion formations, <coughs> structural kind of basis on which uh, to create the ability of people to decide together. This is important. Political systems do that. There, is no, there are no conditions to create a political system at the European level as such. However, the problem is that we are operating in conditions in which democracy need to internalize externalities, need to internalize the, the, the interest of other peoples, and need to internalize the kind of damages that our decision to, can make to other people. This is the problem that uh, uh, also uh, Calypso was referring uh, earlier on. We need in some way for people when they proceed and they will act democratically within a, a supranational or international context to have those kind of uh, principle according to which they can internalize this process and the kind of institutions which are able to do that. And the second uh, kind of condition which I refer and finish on this point is that uh, this creation of principle of a democracy which works within internalizing other democracies' uh, kind of interest or other people's interest has to be done in a way in Europe, in a way in which is determined partly by the way in which the European Union itself has been constructed. We can't start from a tabula rasa, I'm afraid. We would like to, but we can't. And therefore, we need to, in partly to adapt, but partly to change institutions which are already in place. Of course, there are strong interests in terms of policies, groups, which determine the fact that it's very difficult to change these institutions or the attitudes. But that's <coughs> what we politics is about. Therefore, we need to have a, poly, a re, in some way, energize both national democracies and European democracy at the same time by creating institutions and principles which can deal with this international interna, interna, internalization <laughs> of others' democracy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I couldn't possibly uh, begin to summarize that rich um, set of um, uh, talks, and we only have about 40, 45 minutes for, for questions. Um, but I will just pick out three or four things that struck me in some of those um, some of those um, uh, interventions, um, particularly the ones that I found slightly questionable. Um, I'm not sure I entirely sympathise with Andrew Walton's suggestion, if I understood him, that it should, as part of building a more federal, a more successful federal structure, it should be made harder for countries to exit. Um, it made me think a little bit of um, South Carolina in 1861, and perhaps be a bit worried about that, um, uh, especially since this country is actively debating the question of exit from the European Union. Uh, Calypso, um, and so I think I was on Calypso's side of the argument there, I agreed with Calypso that often what happens in the European Union is it creates a mess, and having created a mess, it says the only solution to this mess is to have deeper integration, and I think the Euro is a good example of that. Um, I think, however, it does raise very serious democratic issues when uh, European integration proceeds in this way. Um, and when Calypso said, if I understood her rightly, that there was a strong demand for the creation of the euro, there certainly was at some levels. I don't think there was by the German people. And I'm not sure there was by many voters of other countries. I, I recall, because I was in Brussels at the time, that the Italian parliament debated the question of whether to join the euro for 25 minutes. That was it. And then they voted yes. Um, and the Italian people weren't, of course, consulted. Um, this country decided, rightly or wrongly, that a question like that needed to be put to a referendum, uh, which, of course, was never held because there was never going to be a consensus for it. But the, the input into that process, I think, raised some issues about democratic consent. I did agree with um, Francis um, Geneval that uh, crises can be useful. Um, everybody always says you shouldn't waste a good crisis. 
uh, Europe as usual, uh, because it always it never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity, is I think wasting this crisis. But something may come out of it. Uh, the point about popularity and legitimacy was an interesting one. I, I find myself more concerned about the unpopularity of the European institutions than, for instance, of the US Congress. As far back as I can remember, the US Congress has always been incredibly unpopular. Everybody, It's always come bottom of the polls. But I don't think anybody in the US really questions the legitimacy of the US Congress or suggests we should chuck it out and start again. Um, the problem for the European Union is I think there are people who question the legitimacy of the European institutions, not least the European Parliament and the European Commission, and wonder whether we should chuck them out and start all over again. So I think there is a, a more difficult issue there. Um, and Andrew Duff on the Parliament election next year, it will be interesting to watch. I just simply remark that the turnout at European Parliament elections, as Andrew knows, has fallen every single time since 1979. Um, I am told by uh, reliable political analysts that the, in this country it is widely expected that the UK Independence Party will come top in the 2014 European Parliament elections. In France they expect the National Front to come top in the European elections. Um, that makes me worry even more about whether people will feel the European Parliament is a legitimate um, uh, source of, of democratic input into, into this project. And I'm not convinced, actually, that um, it is so certain there will be a convention in 2015, although if there is, I'm sure Andrew Duff will play a big part in it, as he did in the last convention. Um, and on um, Mr Castiglione, I think you were rather saying that all three possible options for moving forwards were, were not viable, um, which uh, leaves us slightly stuck, perhaps, where we are. Um, I could ask a question or two myself, but I'm also going to look for people to um, raise their hands. So why don't I start with some people in the audience, and then I might chip in a bit later on. I don't know if there's a raving microphone, or you may just have to shout. Um, and you might just say who you are. So I'm going to start with Geoffrey Hosking, who caught my eye first. Uh, yeah, Geoffrey Hosking, professor of Russian history at UCL. I have found the level of discussion so far quite extraordinarily abstract. I mean, it seems to me that the Eurozone does face a very immediate crisis, which I haven't heard much talk about. Uh, when youth unemployment is well over 50% in certain countries, that is so corrupting for a society that it must be treated as a, a serious crisis, an immediate one. Secondly, uh, the Euro uh, could collapse next week, for all we know. It hangs on nothing more, as far as I can see, than promises made by Mario Draghi nearly a year ago, promises which he doesn't actually have the power to fulfill according to the constitution of the European Central Bank. So that any serious crisis in just <coughs> one vulnerable country which crops up next week could lead to the collapse of the euro and possibly with it the collapse of the European Union. I've heard nothing really in this discussion so far which reflects this seriousness. So one of the elements I think we have to discuss is how to deal with an immediate crisis. Um, shall we take another question and then we'll, um, sure. and then we'll answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Johannes Spohr, well, I'm a student, uh, master student at ACI. Um, you both frame the democratic deficit in terms of uh, yeah, decision-making legitimation, but shouldn't we frame it in, in much more broader and more serious terms, uh, actually, especially after what happened on Tuesday, namely the Greek government uh, announcing to, to uh, stop the working of the uh, broadcasting channel there uh, and uh, justifying this by uh, the need to austerity so would you say that uh, this might happen also in other countries that civil rights and the freedom of press are harmed uh, in, uh, because of the austerity pressures put on the countries or would you rather say that it's just a uh, nice vehicle for governments to uh, make silent uh, actors that uh, are not on their lines? Well, let's start with those two. Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add a bit to Jeffrey Hosking's question about the Euro crisis. I mean, and I'm going to start, I think, with Andrew Duff on this one. Um, uh, I, I wonder, you mentioned that we have started, Andrew, to move towards a position where there are, I think I was interpreting you rightly, there are transfers across borders happening. They're maybe a bit disguised, but in a way, that's what the bailout packages were, that there is going to be a system of some support, presumably from the creditor countries to deficit countries, from richer countries to poorer countries. Um, and I, I just wonder also in the light of Geoffrey Hosking's point that this thing, this thing could collapse at any moment if, for instance, Greece were to elect a government that says we want to pull out of the euro, which they nearly did at one point, or if uh, the markets suddenly lose confidence in um, Letta's government, or indeed Spain. Um, do you really think that German taxpayers 
are prepared or their leaders are prepared to institutionalise a system where they are seen to be paying for other countries? Well, I think that uh, that everyone says that Germans uh, do not uh, do that kind of thing. But it's also true, and a more important truth in this uh, situation, that uh, Germany w will uh, not permit the uh, European project to collapse. The, uh, that would be the greater d uh, d disaster for G uh, Germany. Of course, there's a political problem that the Bundestag is now in election mode, and it's very difficult to elevate the quality of the discussion in an election campaign. Germany is like everywhere else in this uh, respect. It's also true that uh, Merkel is extraordinarily ca uh, cautious and inclined to f fatuous uh, <coughs> press communiques with François Hollande, or before then with uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, which are uh, not th the answer to to anything very much. But I do think that the German political and business class is sufficiently serious the instant the elections are out of the way to pick up this challenge directly. Um, and I of course accept that the crisis over youth unemployment is a grave one and that we haven't got the wherewithal to address it. I, I think that a, a corollary of this, of the euro crisis, is the, uh, the refusal of member states to have a proper budget of the European Union, a proper f uh, fiscal uh, capacity that could address seriously uh, these uh, social uh, questions. Um, I don't think that we're going to uh, get out of that problem in a hurry. In, in fact, it's ooh, possible that the MFF, the uh, multi-annual financial <coughs> framework, for the next seven years cannot be agreed. Certainly it can't be agreed under the Irish presidency of the council, which is going to end at the end of this month. So the budgetary future of the union is also in peril. To Can we be certain that these uh, elections next year are going to be an improvement on the <coughs> previous ones. Of course we can't, but uh, if uh, the m missing sinew of a d a democracy is the absence of e European political p parties, proper federal o parties that can ar articulate the o fears and aspirations of the p o people at the e e European le level. We aren't, unfortunately, to have the pan-European e e uh, constituency, w w which I wanted for is that this election, but we are going to have the uh, European uh, p political uh, parties appointing champions uh, who will fight each other for seats and v -o -v -o -v -o -v -o -o votes and j jobs. So the election will be more personalised than it has been before and it will be more e e European. Uh, you, uh, um, the ESM uh, also, just like the MFF, the ESM is too sm small for p purpose 
And one of the things we have to do in the next treaty re 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 revision is to grow the c capacity of the Union itself to b borrow and l lend. Y Euro b bonds are a good idea whose time is to come. Um, Calypso, I think you might say something about um, e EBRT. Um, I thought you would uh, jump on this question, John. <laughs> but maybe one. also a bit about Greek, Greek opinion of the, of the European Union. Well, no, but when you, first of all, uh, the question on real issues, they're linked, of course. And uh, The Economist brilliantly writes every week a whole load of recommendations on how to deal with the immediate issues. And it's very clear if you read The Economist, but not just The Economist, that of course, these solutions come from what nations do with their own budgets and their own policies and, and the cautious balance between austerity and growth policy. Huge debate that we're all having. So the question for us today is what can the EU do in that mix, since it's a domestic, primary domestic? And there are two big ingredients that you know, one thinks a lot about, especially in, including in Greece, one is the need to find financing for growth and youth employment through especially small and medium enterprises. <laughs> and the other is the need to sustain, to have democratically sustainable reforms, whether it's structural reforms or ad hoc reforms. And there the EU you know, can do its own bit. So the, the European Central Bank, and I want to relate this to our democratic debate, because of course that's the problem. You know, we're asked to de de debate democracy, you're asking us to debate policies. They're linked, but it's complicated. Now, the European Central Bank, legitimate but undemocratic, can do something very important through its OMT. Put liquidity in the system, get money flowing, get banks to lend to enterprises. I call this the ECB role in creating democratic space, because if it does that, the ECB creates a space where democracy can start functioning a bit better and serve their citizens. So it's interesting that that's kind of an indirect support, in a way, for democracy. But then you, re you raise the issue of Greek television. That's all to do with both ad hoc, short term, but also long term sustainable reform. Because what is this issue of Greek TV? You know, it's really shocking that, the, yes, Samaras does this without consulting anybody, including the other parties. And, in power, so it is undemocratic. Looks really bad, and it is. And I signed a petition against it. You no, know. but but you have to recognize the problem he's facing. He's facing bo pu both public and private television, hugely corrupt, full of chronism, where the big oligarch family have stolen, you know, uh, TV frequencies in Greece. And you know, democratic. We need, in the name of democracy, because media is part of democracy to just you know, break the whole thing and start from scratch. And that's kind of the message he wants to send you know, by this pure, very dictatorial, shocking kind of thing. Just saying, I'm in charge, and I'm going to you know, break the system. That's, that's the positive reading. You know. I give you the negative reading very quickly. So that's what democracy you know, has to be all about. In the, and the EU then needs to ask itself, well, how do we support the system. So we, you know, tell Tamaras, you know, <coughs> hey, careful, do this a bit better in a democratic way and make sure that people's rights are sustained, <coughs> both the viewers and the, you know, people employed by TV. The EU needs to be a watchdog, but the EU also needs to be mindful of domestic democratic challenges, which are not just about who votes for who when, but they are about really creating a, the much deeper infrastructure of democracy, our fragile democracies in our nation states need to be, you know, whether it's in Italy or in Greece, need to be reinvented and, and re um, kinkled. In, and that's why, you know, what Five Stars also says in Italy, for all its fault, everywhere we have movements which can't really provide the solution but sound the alarm bell. And that's indeed what the EU is confronted with how to respect and in fact increase these democratic spaces nationally while at the same time you know doing the right thing when when national systems go too far and trampling on certain rights um francis chenevel you want to add something yeah um 
far as democracy and the, the crisis is concerned, if, if we were at the time T0 and we would have to create the Eurozone, I would be in favor that every country votes uh, on, of course, the adoption of the Euro, uh, and, and only those join who actually have the popular support uh, in a direct democratic vote for, for the Eurozone. That's uh, time T0. But we're not at time T0, we're in the middle of a crisis. And I think a, a politicization of direct democracy at this point, and I say this even as a Swiss, is probably not the right solution. So again, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think the European democracy deficit is uh, the cause of the problem, and I don't think an immediate democratization or politicization is uh, the, the solution to the problem. It's because we're dealing with specific technical issues uh, and just now, you know, the ECB um, example proves just that. You know, you have a potentially authoritative decision by Mr. Draghi, which is actually creating the space that it leads to a possibility of troubleshooting and, and getting out of the crisis. So the urgent measures that lead out of the crisis are not necessarily the basis for the future democratic Europe. And it shouldn't be thought that way necessarily. I must say, sometimes in retrospect, I think what we should have had is a vote in Germany on who to let into the European Union, um, into, the Euro into the Eurozone, perhaps into the European Union as well, um, but certainly into the Eurozone. Um, uh, many Germans, I think, would have felt that they shouldn't have let Greece into the Eurozone. Um, but the trouble is that once many a country's Greece, in, so many Greeks may have felt it as well. <laughs> The trouble, is, the trouble is that the electors of Europe are now being told, even if you have doubts about whether you should have joined the Eurozone, getting out is going to be much worse for you, so you're stuck. Um, I've got two more questions, one here. Right. Um, Robert Biedler from Swansea University. Um, I, I think um, a Andrew and Calypso, between them, went to the heart of the matter. Uh, Andrew emphasised that the Euro Eurozone that's presently constituted involves a lot of restrictions or limitations. It doesn't, it's mainly about limiting the freedom of manoeuvre of states rather than uh, enabling states to do more. Um, to, to go beyond the limitations, to actually have a Eurozone system that allows states to do more, makes the whole system stronger, would involve going towards much fuller federal union. But Calypso highlighted the reasons why that's really not um, advisable and, and possibly not possible. So that we've got a kind of halfway house between state autonomy and full federal union, which doesn't give us the best of both worlds, it actually gives us the worst of both worlds. We neither have the full benefits of the increased empowerment, um, sharing of costs, sharing of risks, cushioning of negative economic impacts that full federal union would grant, but we do have a lot of limitations on state autonomy. And the big difference that monetary union has compared with all previous major policies and institutions of the European Union is that it does actually require, to make it work, it does require serious encroachment on state autonomy, state freedom of manoeuvre. All the previous policies, even those that appeared to encroach on state sovereignty, actually in practice turned out to allow states to do more together than they could separately. So that the kind of formal um, constitutional reservations were overridden or overcome <coughs> in popular sentiment especially by perception that this was allowing more to be delivered um, and, 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 and the de increased delivery created the um, popular support uh, which allowed this to continue. Um, monetary Union initially seemed to do this, uh, as Calypso put it, it gave everybody what they wanted initially, from 2001 to 2008, it did give lower interest rates, it did provide lower inflation, it did allow Germany to become more internationally competitive because the Eurozone exchange rate was somewhat lower than the Deutsche Mark would have been on, on, on its own. So it, it, it did benefit, seem to be everybody won under that situation. Um, but but where I would um, qualify what Francie Chernobyl was saying, Agreed, the Eurozone system didn't create the crisis that we're in, but it has severely, it's had a big impact and has, uh, in many ways limits the capacity of the Eurozone countries to react to a crisis that originated in the Atlantic economies, in the US and, and, and in the UK and Iceland uh, primarily, and maybe Ireland and Spain uh, to much lesser degrees. But, but it's the Atlantic economies which were the epicenter of the crisis. Uh, but the Atlantic economies retain a much greater freedom of manoeuvre. They're not locked in to institutional frameworks that bind them uh, and rule out certain options. 
to the degree that the Eurozone is. And I think the Eurozone is in danger of functioning in much the same way as the gold standard did during the 1930s, when some countries tried to maintain their adherence to the gold standard, and this had the effect in those countries, uh, the gold block, of, of actually deepening and prolonging the 1930s depression. Uh, it was too rigid and didn't allow sufficient flexibility to, to, to allow countries to deal with the crisis. Um, and, and flexibility is what is most needed currently. Yes, sorry. Okay, I think we've got the point. Yeah. I'm going to take two more questions and then come back to the panel. One there, maybe three more questions. <coughs> in fact. My name is Philip Lamparet, and my question is easier. So, uh, <laughs> there seems to be a background uh, uh, agreement that uh, however democracy works in Europe, it will need to take into account the interests of all Europeans, in particular the interdependences between those interests. Now, two mechanisms for doing that have been suggested. One by the two Andrews, uh, which is something like a pan-European uh, constituency for at least part of the seats of uh, the European Parliament, uh, so that uh, people who campaign on that uh, in, in, in that constituency are driven by electoral interest to take into interest and to uh, invoke the interest of all the Europeans. The mechanism may be too weak, the fine grain of the mechanism uh, will need to be looked at, but I can see how that works. The other mechanism uh, is uh, what uh, uh, Dario, uh, supported more by Dario and Calypso, what Dario uh, uh, described as uh, each of the national parliaments internalizing uh, the externalities produced on the other. And my question then to both of you, possibly also to Francis, if he shares that view, how will that work? Because politicians are not philanthropic uh, idealists that care about their own electorates. How are they going to made, be made to care for the interests of uh, the electorates of their neighbors? So, well, how will this internalization <coughs> of externalities actually operate? Yeah, there and then one there, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, please. Yes, uh, my name is Andreas Kutras. Do you want to stand up? Oh. <laughs> yes. uh, I think we're underestimating the role of the ECB in creating the crisis. Uh, simply because I'm, I'm in the financial markets, I'm not a political economist or anything like that. For a number of years, the interest rates, as many said, was about 2% whereas local economies would have done with 8 or 9 percent, like the Irish economy in the boom years. So the one suit fits for all a monetary policy which was responsible for huge local bubbles like in Spain, Italy, and, uh, and uh, Ireland, I'm not going to say Greece, in my home country. Uh, so the institution of the ECB, which is as said legitimate but unaccountable, and I am democratic, uh, first created the problem. And now we see increasingly more powers to the ECB trying to solve. And they seem to be doing a good job. But one side effect, one side effect of this is that the increased powers of the ECB, which as I said before, is not only in democratic, is also unaccountable. So I want to address the uncountability of the ECB, not only in terms of one direct policy, but the increased powers of it. OK, and then one behind. Uh, I'm Iris Goldman. I'm a professor of EU law and a German lecturer at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Law. And uh, I would like to address the question, the issue of legitimacy from the legal point of view. Uh, it has already been addressed several times, but not too much. And I believe it has already been said that, well, even though the treaty rules have not caused the crisis, they're actually preventing <coughs> the political and fiscal changes and the reactions to the crisis, and I do agree with that. On the other hand, I would appreciate your, your thoughts on, on the way I see the current instrumentalizing uh, of the rules and procedures, both of EU law, of international law, and of national law, in order to reach and to uh, achieve certain political aims and fiscal goals, basically. And I would like to, to mention several examples. First is the, the treaty amendment that has been done um, in order to make an uncontestable judicial basis for certain mechanisms. Second is the Pringle judgment, which in my opinion is extremely pragmatic and nothing more than that, basically. Um, and third is basically uh, 
the, the strange combination interplay between international law, which is the legal basis for both the fiscal compact and the ESM, uh, and the national law, which actually plays an, in, an important role in this because the fiscal compact has to be implemented in international law, and EU law, which is also very important because the EU institutions play an, enorm, an important role here. Uh, and here, again, we have this problem that is going on, that is continuing if we look at the financial transaction tax and uh, the UK reaction to that in terms of the court proceedings before the Court of Justice, uh, questioning the legitimacy of the enhanced cooperation as the legal basis for it, and the possible establishment of the banking union, again with a potentially contestable legal basis. Thank you. Okay, that's four, um, four questions, um, which will probably take us most of the, most of the rest of the time. Um, the, euro did cause, the euro did cause the crisis. Um, I think, Francis, you might answer that one. Well, um, we have to distinguish. I, I said the democratic deficit of the European Union did not cause uh, the crisis. Um, <coughs> and I think we also have a lot of non-reflective counterfactuals. What would have happened if... You know, what would have happened if countries were not in the euro, they could devalue, they could have, you know, had devaluation. But then we have to go back to the discussion, why was the euro introduced in the first place? Uh, and why did it bring stability during a long time? Uh, why was the instability of different countries constantly devaluating their currencies differently? Uh, also a problem for the European economy. Where would the European economy be today if we still had that kind of a system, plus the financial crisis, uh, the worst financial crisis we had since the 30s. So there are a lot of uh, counterfactuals. But I, I, I'm just saying uh, um, we, we have that financial crisis in countries that are centralized, that are federal states, that are European unions, that are municipalities. We have, we have different structures, different political structures. Uh, and we have uh, similar fi financial uh, crises. And of course, the low interest rates, um, you know, as Caluto has said, we're, we're part of of this, but Switzerland has had very low interest rates uh, traditionally, and it didn't lead to the same consequences. So you can't say because of, you know the ECB is the cause of the crisis with its low interest rates, um, etc. So um, I think uh, all of these uh, counterfactuals uh, of the past are are rather uh, problematic. What I would like to say is I think the introduction of the euro. It was a hidden constitutional moment because, as has been said clearly, it has an inbuilt Sachzwang, as the Germans say so wonderfully, it has an inbuilt Sachzwang to centralization. Uh, and so uh, what looks to citizens as, oh, we'll just get a different currency, is a disguised way of you know, embarking on a path of, of being forced, ever, ever more forced in political, in, into political union. And so it's like a cunning of money uh, that is supposed to bring about a political union in Europe. And I think that was what Shabatari had in mind. You know, it's sort of, uh, you can't put the question openly to the Europeans, do you want a political union? But you can put the question, well, do you want the currency? And that looks kind of attractive. And what you're buying is political union in disguise uh, down the road, or at least the necessity to, to bring it about. That's why I think it's, 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 it's so important when you set up a, a, a currency area like this, that it has to be, it has to be made clear what it implies politically, and that has to be, uh, it has to be put to the citizens, uh, to the citizens' vote. But as I'm saying, as we're in the crisis, I don't think this kind of politicization and direct democracy is now the solution. Because if the euro crisis, you know, if, if it's, there's an imminent risk of breakdown next week, that tells you we, we don't have the time to set up the democratic institutions. Uh, and set up the votes, etc. So there's there's troubleshooting needed, and, and there's there's technical expertise uh, action uh, needed. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, Calypso or, or Dario, do you want to deal with? I think this I think this question was in part about if national parliaments play a bigger role, can they do so in a European yeah. way rather than just nationally? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I just want to say something about it. I'm afraid that, yes, we're very uh, abstract, because also we have five minutes, but also we are given one question, which was, does federalism address the issue of democratic legitimacy or not? So perhaps the next panel can answer your question about <laughs> youth unemployment. The, the other thing, 
I just come to that particular question. But the other thing that uh, in some way my position is in some way the opposite of what you were saying earlier on. You are presenting the fact that uh, we are in a situation in which, uh, or the, wor the worst of the possible worlds, neither a more centralized, uh, therefore, you know, democratic, nor a kind of more uh, diffused, and uh, but that's where we are. The, the democracies in Europe are interconnected. They. The process has been developed in that, in that direction because we have chosen partly too, but also because these are the conditions of modern democracies in this more globalized thing. So the problem is how do we, in a democracy, I take that we internalize as individuals, as groups, we internalize the externality of our actions, but through the democratic system and through democratic legitimacy. I may, in some way, in some decisions, policy decisions, be on the losing side. I may pay more taxes than I want, than perhaps I want to. But I know that I'm gaining on other grounds. And I know that uh, perhaps to maintain a certain kind of uh, re political regime or a political community which give me, gives me other kind of benefit, <coughs> I'm prepared to pay certain kind of prices. That's the kind of internal, internal, internalization that uh, a democratic community provides. The question becomes how different democracies try to interact together by, by similar kind of mechanisms. In Europe, unless we can uh, in some way make them more federal and therefore create a bigger community, but most, many of us think that that is not really feasible in those conditions. What do we do? Well, what the European Union has done so far is created a number of institutions which are of a more supranational level, but they decide <coughs> only certain things. It's created the structure of uh, uh, legalization and the, the growing of uh, legal procedures, which in some way may be in some way set by people, but they are not in some way justified democratically. In particular, it's used intergovernmental or uh, regu regulatory kind of regimes to try to solve problems which very often are presented as uh, Pareto optimal, but they're not. And the economic <coughs> crisis has shown, has shown that. So what is, my, my was only a question, my, in a sense, uh, the question was, how do we in some way make the national democracy participate more, and therefore the national citizens in interna internalize more these kind of uh, processes, uh, which in some way involve uh, kind of externalities on both sides. Now, the intervention of parliament, much more, and not simply government, in the democratic process at the European level, may be one of the solutions. But there may be others that one should explore. So the point is, the, the internalization should not simply happen at governmental level or simply through the kind of uh, commission or bureaucratic level. It has to be much more part of our internal democratic processes. Unless that happens, also our internal democratic processes are going to be, in some way, um, eroded, as in some countries this is happening. Um, does, no, yes, and does anybody want to answer the question of the accountability of the central bank? Could you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, Andrew might. Yes. Well, Calypso, well, Calypso, you have to <laughs> say, say one or two things, Calypso, but not too much. <laughs> uh, I'll let, uh, I mean, can I say something? Well, no, <laughs> no, I think let's speak for a couple of oh, minutes, and then I'm going to hand the floor to oh, Andrew, or the other we Andrew. We have too much to say about everyone. <laughs> yes. But let me just say to Philips and echoing Dario, you know, the problem with these debates, we tend, to, we tend to be too black and white about this. So you took um, Andrew's wonderful uh, advocacy of trans-European lists for the European <coughs> Parliament. I have defended Andrew, and I have advocated this for, you know, 30 years, <laughs> or when, you know, ever since my political consciousness started, um, and more than that, 40 years. <laughs> Whatever. I'm exaggerating. I'm great. Uh, the point is, that is a great democratic uh, vision of European politics, that there be, you know, the, the French campaigning in Italy and Latvians campaigning in the UK, brilliant. That is all about people speaking to one another and, and getting interested in each other's political scenes so that they can speak to them in English. But, yeah, that's par for the course. So, great. 
Now that, and we need, in fact, if we believe in democracy in Europe, to multiply, multiply fields and means of, of democratic you know, effervescence and existence, especially since most people don't really care. So you've got to wake them up. Such transnational lists would wake them up. Uh, in part, not, but it doesn't matter if most of their lives are not about democracy, you know, they'll do other things, but at least to the extent that, okay. But, on the other hand, um, that doesn't mean that, of course, it's such a, uh, the, the, the idea that national parliaments or national political systems should learn to internalize externalities better is somehow weird from a political viewpoint. First of all, it's weird enough for national politicians to have to justify what is decided in Brussels. We know it works, it's very difficult because you're one among many, so you, you know, you, your view can be overridden, and indeed, even if it's not, you like to scapegoat Brussels, all these things we know. 